I was posting some photos of these extensions I see all around the city. And I started to call them like, uh, I don't know how to say like the, from the addition, we extended it a bit. And then after a couple of photos, it just clicked like, I can, I can make an Instagram account just for this. I mean, really there was not much thought into it. I just like, I was on my phone, like took, 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 made an Instagram account, gave it that, that name and there it was. So completely no thinking, no planning, no, I don't know, uh, some, yeah, like bigger plan. Agenda. Like, now I'm, yeah, yeah, agenda, like now I'm going to do this and that. It was just like, I'm looking up all the time when I'm walking around the city and I'm seeing this uh, extensions and I had the impression and it turns out I'm right that a lot of people are not doing that they are not like looking up to buildings all the time and they're uh, not noticing these extensions that are uh, obviously illegal or semi-legal extra legal and that are everywhere around us and I just thought like, oh yeah it's an interesting phenomena let's give it an Instagram account and that's how it happened. Um, I started to post uh, some funny or satirical comments. So it's not just photos of this phenomenon of this extra legal uh, extensions. It's also with this um, satirical comments, which I'm, um, that also uh, 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 came spontaneously, but I think it is the right approach. I mean, for me, in my opinion, because uh, it gives the whole thing the dose of humor, which I think is really important for people around here, maybe also in, uh, around the world, um, to, to keep broader public engaged in such a actually important and serious topic. If I have presented that it's some serious stuff, you know, give it a serious uh, analysis and big architectural words and so on, my impression is that the general public would wouldn't uh, would feel offended almost maybe wouldn't be engaged I th maybe yes. they would think it's boring or uh, i don't know what but i think uh, that it has a much more bigger broader audience when you put it in a satirical way uh uh first of all and the second of all um i'm not in time I actually have an agenda behind it. I mean, I had it at that point, but I just didn't know it. My agenda was and still is to show that this phenomena is not something that um, some, I don't know, like uh, people, individuals are doing because they're mean, they're bad or whatever, but to show that this is the system, that this is a phenomenon that comes from the top, that uh, basically it's corruption that's it, that is in the core. I mean, we can talk more about it later on. The corruption that is in the core of this phenomena and uh, the system is um, in a way encouraging you or helping you or enabling you to build semi-legally and, and to, to have our city filled and covered with this extra legal constructions. So my idea was and still is to show that, okay, this is not something that you can point your finger at some person, but you have to look, at, be aware that the system is the problem and we need to change that. And I'm doing that not by, you know, um, putting it you know, in, on big, in big letters, but image by image, comment by comment, uh, making it look funny and satirical, but actually having this uh, point behind it and trying to be mm. at the end i'm trying to to make it like an educational page although it doesn't look like that and so <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no i think it's definitely educational um if if we just stop for a moment and try to explain what exactly uh these architectural um uh, manifestations are of this phenomenon that you're talking about mm -hmm. uh uh, how to put this complicated story short. Anyways, this illegal building was, in my opinion, in my research, always present in Belgrade, I mean, all over the world, basically. But let's say that Belgrade has this um, relationship with illegal building, uh, illegal construction since the first, first planning steps, like the late 19th century, the earliest uh, 20th century. So there was always uh, this illegality, how to call it, uh, happening. 
but it had different forms and different uh, causes, to put it simple. Mm -hmm. To maybe not to go into the whole history now, um, in the period of socialist, to try to go a bit faster, in the period of socialist Yugoslavia, um, there was a completely different uh, planning uh, system and agenda that it is now that we see, in, especially in the uh, capitalist uh, world. So the, the apartment was something that was a constitutional right at some point. And uh, the system, the socialist system was designed in that way that the big companies mostly would build the apartments and the people who work there would um, get the apartments. Part from their salary was going to that fund and so on and so on. But the system was supposed to make sure that you have a roof uh, over your head. And that was your constitutional right. And everybody was supposed to get a roof over their head. It was a really noble idea, in my opinion, uh, and a lot of it was done. We can talk about it later when we talk about New Belgrade and so on. But uh, of course, it was not perfect and the uh, construction went slow. There were a lot of problems, actually. So the first illegal settlements started to grow uh, in Belgrade. In my opinion, that was a way to, let's say, to buy a social peace. So everybody knew about Kalujerica, for example, an illegal settlement but they turned their head around because uh, obviously the system could not provide those people, mostly workers or uh, gastarbeiters, as we say, people who went abroad to work and then came uh, back here and to house their families and so on. So they had to do it on their own. And the system, the, the authorities were just turning their head and not seeing this phenomenon. So we had this big illegal settlement that was it was illegal, but you know the banks were giving loans and there was electricity. So you already have this semi-legality happening in a way. Then the 80s, the global crisis, crisis here, transition happening in a way and so on. Uh, the first laws was, were introduced that allowed people to, let's say, um, house themselves in a way. So this whole big idea of system housing you was uh, starting to get abandoned. And that's when this first, um, how do you say, con con conversions started to happen. Rooftops that were communal spaces uh, were turned into apartments and so on and so on. So the first steps of people uh, building, not just building on their own, but turning these communal spaces in, in buildings in the city into apartments. And then the 90s came. The 90s here were uh, the, dark, the dark age, the years of uh, civil war, uh, embargo, and um, I mean, complete chaos in every aspect. And of course, when it comes to the city uh, planning and construction. So the whole city was more or less built illegally. I will, I will mention later on the stealth uh, group, the Stealth Unlimited, and previously the cell group, the colleagues of mine who researched this, um, uh, this period, I can show some publications, but let me just finish this chronology. And a uh, very interesting period, especially when it comes to this wild construction and they named the, uh, Belgrade the wild city and it was completely wild. And then the 2000 came, the big shift, uh, the democratic uh, change. So democracy finally came and so on. But when we look at planning, we see that uh, these mechanisms of the 90s and of everything that was happening before, in a way, the legacy of this semi-legal building was still very strong and continued, but just in a bit different form. To put it simple, I would say that more and more, as we go from 2000 to now, the big players had the opportunity to build semi-legally. So now it's not just uh, you want to put the I don't know, a bulk to put, uh, how do you say, to cover up the balcony so you can have a couple of square meters more. But now the big players um, were enabled in a way to build a couple of rooftop uh, stories more and to present them as like one story and I don't know what. And then it, it, in reality, it's three stories and so on. And then we have the law of, uh, how to translate, the law of legalization that basically gave you the legal right to uh, build first and legalize later on. And in my opinion, that is something 
that was like, okay, now we're legally formalizing this, uh, uh, how do you say, the, the mechanism of building illegally and then legalizing. Now that's completely legit. And that became practice, more or less. Of course, it depends how powerful you are, who you know, it's still corruption behind it and so on. Maybe we can talk about it more later on. But basically that's, that's what we're seeing, not just when it comes to uh, building construction, but when it comes to our society uh, in general, when it comes to planning in general, what I see is that we uh, build first, uh, uh, legalize later. Uh, the authorities make uh, backdoor deals first, and then they bring plans, which are there just to uh, legalize what was already uh, set before. And, so yeah, that, that is something that, that is our reality. That is something that is happening. So the whole city of Belgrade and the whole Serbia and the whole re region, and it goes even further on, is covered in this extra legal construction, as we can call it, as a colleague, uh, Dubravka Sekulic named it in her book. So uh, the constructions that happen without more or less any plan, any uh, safety checks or whatever, that just, happen and then are legalized and legit after uh, later on and are there to stay, which is actually the biggest problem. So the city is now sprinkled with these uh, extensions. I think basically every building you look at, uh, even like governmental buildings or buildings yeah. that, um, um, you know, you wouldn't expect to have little peculiarities and odd uh, moments of kind of adjustment um, have it. Mm -hmm. What is also interesting, because we are not looking at the Instagram page, so maybe just to describe it, it's not just these extensions, because they uh, mostly occur in this manner, in this uh, extra legal field. Most of the time, uh, they don't fit. I mean, you can see, you can tell when you look at the building, you can tell that this was something that was extended afterwards, uh, not in a legal way or completely legal way. And that is why what my Instagram page is documented. So I'm not going into details with every uh, building I'm taking a putting, putting a photo of. It's just, if it doesn't look right, most likely it's not right. The process behind it, it's not right. And I'm just showing that, you know, if, see, I'm not judging, I don't know what happened, but it doesn't look right. So something is catchy about this. So what is the consequence of this on the architectural profession in Serbia? I mean, uh, how does the profession exist within this kind of environment? There are many, many consequences. Uh, first, when we come to consequences on our society, on our city, because you have uh, this, how do you say, domination of having uh, more and more square meters, not just with this extra legal, construction but with construction in general um, and most of the time the, the investors find ways to just put more and more square meters uh, we don't have the infrastructure that supports it so from parking places to you know, city uh, greenery hospitals schools sewage exactly so we just have more and more square meters that we we are not even sure that we didn't plan and we are not even sure how many of them are and they just become part of the city. I mean, I think it's understandable how dangerous, I mean, how, how dangerous for city life, for, for uh, city to function properly, that is. When it comes to architectural um, profession, uh, it's interesting that so far, I don't think that we have a single, how do you say, like a, a, a file complaint or, um, that single architect who who uh, build uh, extra legally or, or who in some way was part of this process of um, presenting less square meters, less stories than there was actually built, nobody was ever, nobody ever ha suffered any consequences. So in this context, uh, that is something that is normalized and our architectural profession is obviously saying okay yeah that's a okay way to build that's legit why not do it and i think that is 
that is a disaster because we are building a city as it looks on my Instagram page. And yeah, go on the Instagram page and see how it looks. I mean, mm. no, I think we will have a link. One aspect. <laughs> Yeah, but but you know, I, I'm just thinking from a perspective of somebody who's studying architecture, and you yourself studied architecture um, yes. at the at the faculty in Belgrade, uh, University of Belgrade, um, and as somebody who studies architecture in this kind of environment and comes out from from a kind of education uh, which presumably doesn't teach you about how to build little extensions of balconies and enclose them and extend your living rooms into what used to be a balcony or have a kind of extended kitchen and storage space, which is what these extensions are. Yeah. What does a young person expect from profession in terms of what you can achieve as an architect? And uh, also in relationship to a kind of socialist inheritance, which are this kind of big master projects um, around Yugoslavia, you know, big new cities, uh, big civic buildings. How, how does one kind of bring those two things together? What, what do you think? I'm not sure how it is now. When I was a student, I, I graduated master studies 12 years ago. Yes, 12 years ago. I'm a PhD student now, but that's different. So uh, when uh, I was in my bachelor in master studies, my impression is that um, uh, we were trained, all of us were trained to be star architects. And I mean, that is completely insane in my opinion, because uh, I mean, I don't think there is even need to go into this discussion now, of course not. Uh, how many of uh, architects from Serbia are gonna be star architects? I mean, this is, we don't have the market for it and so on and so on. So uh, first of all, this whole phenomena of, uh, extra legal construction was completely ignored. And I think more or less it's still ignored from academia, from institutions in a way and so on. So uh, we are um, trained to be architects uh, by completely ignoring, I don't know, at least 30% of our uh, physical surroundings. Second of all, this uh, socialist heritage was also not a, a, a big topic when I was a student. Of course, you always have some professors who teach you about it, and you have a. Now, on my PhD studies, we have good, we had good professors who talked about it, and so on. So maybe things also change, but more or less, the focus is, I think, in uh, as I said, in becoming a, a good uh, architect designer, projectant. Is that how you how you say it? Ar architect designer in designing <laughs> this good contemporary. Uh, buildings and my impression is that the focus in, is on aesthetics, which is completely different from what we see around us. But uh, the good thing is that in the last seven or eight years, I'm not completely sure, uh, there is this master course um, in integral urbanism, integral urbanism, integral urban planning. Uh, that's more or less a new thing because, as I said, uh, uh, that wasn't around when I was studying, but I am closely cooperating with uh, some of the professors from that course, and I know um, uh, I'm following what they're doing, what they're teaching students, what are the courses, and so on, and I think that is completely fantastic because they have the topics uh, that actually uh, they're training students to deal not only with the aesthetics of architecture, with uh, urban planning in terms of uh, how many, uh, I don't know, square meters here and what to put there and so on, but with this whole concept of uh, society, how to say, you know, so, mm -hmm. so planning within, uh, within the society and seeing it actually also as a political topic in a way, which I think is very important and very real. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When, so when you finished your studies, you've kind of, at what point were you aware of this kind of peculiarities that you, um, that I guess inspired you or kind of set you on a slightly different route in terms of professional life? When I finished my studies, I wasn't aware at all. But I, again, I think it, it 
it goes from case to case. Uh, this Stealth Unlimited that I mentioned, friends uh, from this Stealth uh, Unlimited group, uh, Anna Jokic and Mark Nealon, actually they were doing very good things when they were studying during the 90s. And they started to, as I mentioned, to, to deal with this topic. Anna Jokic is from our faculty to deal with this topic mm -hmm. of uh, wild city and extra legal city while they were, I think, while they were students. So I, as I said, I think it goes from case to case. My case, uh, I didn't like the way this whole, uh, uh, the architecture was presented at the faculty, how we, as I mentioned, dealt with aesthetics more or less and not with this whole broader concept of society. And uh, yeah, I was playing in a band at the time. So when I finished studies, I was just, uh, I spent a couple of years at more or less uh, traveling Europe and touring with my band and playing and that was my focus because I so didn't like this. I also, at first, uh, while I was still a student, I worked at this international office in Germany. So I had a really good job and a chance to see how things are done internationally and I didn't like it. So yeah, I was totally like, okay, I, I, I don't want to have more or less anything to do with this, with architecture and so on. But then in time, through, through totally different channels, uh, I started to see that uh, um, there is a lot more to it, a lot more is possible, and that we can deal with it, with our physical surroundings and urban planning in a different way. Uh, one of the the... the Focus is this Instagram page, but the other is uh, the other focus also what I do uh, besides this page, and I do a lot of other stuff, as you know, from activism to uh, educational projects, working with young people, uh, giving lectures, researching, and so on and so on. So, so you found you found your way. Uh, what I'm trying to get to is actually yeah. to understand how you found your way into um, a kind of cultural platform that exists in Belgrade, uh, which is a kind of non-for-profit organization uh, yeah. called uh, Center for Cultural Decontamination. I don't know. It kind of it was a how do you say a set of circumstances. Uh, as I said, I started researching on my own at some point after the, the, I finished my studies. And I started actually to write about uh, architecture and urban planning. That was my first, one of my first focuses, to research and to write. So I wrote for um, all different magazines and so on. And I wrote an article about this concentration camp in Belgrade, the former concentration camp. Uh, that is abandoned and in a way forgotten. And about this Generalstab building, the army building that was bombed in 99 and is also just stands there as a ruin since then. I wrote it for this um, in Chicago magazine run by some architects, the Mess, Mess, I, I forgot the name now, it doesn't matter. Anyways, um, and uh, uh, a friend of mine, an older uh, friend of mine, uh, saw this, read this article. I don't know how, how he came into it, how he bumped into it, but actually he read it. And at the time at the Center for Cultural Decontamination, there was a project going on about four concentration camps in, in uh, Belgrade. And for some reason, I don't remember now, it was six or seven years ago, it was seven years ago. They needed some help, uh, so he invited me. So he just called me to have a chat, to talk, and so on. And the next thing, I start working there. So uh, at first, uh, uh, first it wasn't. It didn't have anything to do strictly with architecture. That was that was an architecture topic, but I was there in a way to help with all sorts of things, from websites to running projects, programs. Uh, we did the first thing we did was a uh, uh, 20th uh, uh, birthday exhibition. So I designed the exhibition, the construction, and so on and so on. Uh, because especially when you work in culture in Serbia, 
you kind of do everything. You know, there is, we don't have the luxury of having one person specialized for one thing. So we are a small team. Mm -hmm. We have to ha have to help each other. And it's like one that's, person that's does a, all. Yeah. That's quite a fascinating story, especially um, if I guess one knows the kind of image of the Center for Cultural Determination within a Serbian society, there is a certain kind of contested element of, of the organization being a kind of quite liberal and self-critical organization. So, you know, I thought that there was a more of a kind of political uh, relationship that you, that might have started the uh, uh, your involvement there. But can you can you explain yeah. the kind of um, this kind of complex role that the Center for Cultural Decontamination plays within within Serbian society? Well, I can try. I'm not sure if I can explain it. I can try. But just to say, uh, I, it was a political thing because this uh, topic of concentration camps in Serbia is you know, we, we met each other on this topic, which is quite interesting now that that was the topic, but okay, not, not to go, True. Uh, not to go there. Um, but yeah, the Center for Cultural Decontamination was founded on 1st of January, 1995, at, at sharp, how do you say, uh, sharp at noon, at noon sharp, how do you say. Um, and it was founded by, our late founder, Borka Pavicevic, and uh, uh, several friends. Uh, it grew out of the anti-war movement uh, in the 90s, as I mentioned, there was civil war in the 90s. So this anti-war movement, um, let's say that a group of cultural activists gathered uh, and they decided to build, a, a, well, basically a public space that would be independent and free uh, from this, what our society was presenting uh, uh, back in the days, in this war, war, um, yeah, everything that was pro-war. Uh, and of course, we tried to construct different societies. So yeah, uh, uh, it was founded in 95 uh, uh, out of the old, um, abandoned building that was the first museum, private museum in Serbia the, that belongs to Veljkovic family. They reconstructed it. It was a very interesting process how it went. So they basically squatted the place and uh, bits by bits they started to, to make it uh, functional because there was no roof, no electricity, no toilet. There are stories behind it that are just a and this is 1995. Yeah, from 1995, so so through the to the 90s, the German embassy was just around. I mean, in front of our our place, so people who were waiting in a line for German embassy tried to get out of the country were coming to our improvised toilet, and I mean, just stories. And I remember Borka saying, so one day he came to the German ambassador and she said, like, okay, you have to put some order here. I mean. We cannot have so many people coming to the toilet that was not even part of the building and so on. So you have to put some order here. And she said, I'm coming to work next day. And they put this, how do you say, this snake line in front of the embassy, like for people to wait in order. And Bork was right, like, right, that's right. not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so things like that. And it was mostly um, a house focused on theater. It is a cultural institution, a cultural center. But in those late 90s, early 2000s, I think you could say the theater was um, the main focus. Also because Borka was a, uh, uh, how do you say, dra dramaturg, dramaturg? A theater director. Theater director, uh, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but of course and, there was a lot of uh, uh, other, uh, uh, production from our side, from uh, Tzazakada side happening. And we, uh, we built a safe space for other organizations uh, and individuals as well. So our motto is a place where people come to feel free. Uh, and in these 26 years now, we have a really big uh, uh, production in terms of uh, theater plays, uh, debate programs, workshops, uh, festivals, I mean, you name it, we did it. And we also hosted uh, a 
huge number of events of other organization of uh, a partner organization from civil society from uh, margin groups uh, and so on and so on so um, you can say that yeah we are a, as you as you you gave a good introduction a cultural institution but i would not put a focus on it it's just we try to uh, deal with topics and talk about topics that are in a way uh, uh, oppressed, that are political, that are critical, and that we find that are important for building a better society. Hmm. And you're, you're quite often attacked by sort of far right groups, and you're labeled as uh, traitors and um, foreign, foreign uh, spies or something like that. Yes. Yeah, so so what is it like? Uh, kind of what... Borka as a woman was especially uh, attacked uh, as a trader and so on and uh, I mean we suffer all kind of pressure it's not really easy to to put finger on it all because it is from media uh, sometimes it is like a direct attacks as you as you mentioned sometimes we have uh, right-wing groups coming to our courtyard and shouting and whatever but sometimes we have as uh, with this festival presenting the Kosovo um, art scene Merdita um, that we host for seven years now, I think. Um, we have like a bunch of police coming to protect us. And uh, it's also a way of oppression in my opinion, because the authorities are actually sending a bunch of police that then is presented in the media that we are the, uh, the how do you say, the dangerous place. That is a dangerous place when you're, when you're not supposed to go. Mm -hmm. So that is also a way of, uh, building a negative image around around us and around what we do. So yeah, we suffer all, all kind of uh, uh, pressure, but that is something that when you, when if you want to work there, you are aware of it. And that is something that you are agreed to in a way, because uh, from my perspective, at least, I think, you know, that is the price you have to pay if you want to go against the grain, against this uh, oppressive, uh, uh, regime in a way and the values if you want to fight for better values so to say so what so you 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 organize a uh, art uh, a festival every year that presents because, the work of because, Alba, uh, of kosovan artists people people that are not from serbia might not understand how controversial that is uh -huh. um, well uh Okay, so the, the Grazinski Initiative, Initiative Omarik, so the other uh, um, civil society organizations are organizing this festival each year. That is, uh, uh, let's say the goal of the festival is to uh, uh, bring artists from Serbia and from Kosovo uh, in order to start a dialogue, a mutual, how to say co-life and so on. So to go uh, over this wall basically that we have between Serbia and Kosovo because um, uh, Kosovo is uh, an independent country and Serbia is not accepting that. So there is a big propaganda also uh, um, focused on that in media and so on. So, and uh, Kosovo is a big, big issue in Serbia, the future of Kosovo, what will happen with it, with it will it be uh, acknowledged as an independent country or not. So it's a big political theme. And just by uh, uh, having people, artists from Kosovo here is a big issue. So this right wing groups that are always uh, reacting when we close this festival and when this festival is organized, they don't even go into what is being presented in this festival. It's just the fact that the Kosovo artists are presenting in Belgrade, it's a scandal. And it's, each year there is a really big fuss about it, protests uh, from the right-wing group and- um, Police. It, police, and last year they put posters all around uh, uh, our uh, institution and this Veljkovic house, which is uh, actually protected as a heritage and so on and so on. I mean, the reason why I 
uh, kind of ask you to talk about it is because I kind of want to paint a picture of Serbia as a quite complex society where there are all these myths on which the society um, operates um, that are completely fictional and that um, are also part of the structures that result in a kind of um, oppression of built environment. Um, Yes, so I, I mean, think that's why it's kind of interesting to mention that it's also it's all connected, of course, I mean, if we would talk now about the Kosovo uh, issue and the 90s and our authorities, I think it would be a big political uh, debate. I'm not sure if um, we have time for it, actually. I also wanted to mention that, as you said, the Center for Cultural Decontamination was founded in 1995 as I said, out of this anti-war movement. But unfortunately, 26, seven years later, uh, I'm not sure how much things have changed in our society. So the things that center was found uh, fighting against and fighting for in the beginning, more or less, we're there now. So this, um, I don't know how to put it like, a oppression or this set of values or uh, anti-democratization and so on. It, through these 26, seven years, we're, we're still dealing with same things. Of course, I think we, we made a lot of progress in some, on some topics, in some, on some fields, but in general, yeah, it's a pretty long fight. Um, so just to paint a picture of where the society is right now and how that affects uh, the built environment in Belgrade. We have gone from a kind of totalitarian government in the 1990s and then a kind of brief attempt of democratic uh, society in 2000s and then we've uh, now kind of gone back to the ruling elite that was pretty much in power or that was kind of uh, growing up in the 1990s in terms of rhetoric and, you know, values, I guess. So, I mean, you say that we're pretty much in the same place, but are there any new kind of urban, are there any new mechanisms that this new government, that the current government is using in order to kind of uh, undermine the built environment in Serbia and Belgrade? Uh, as I mentioned in this brief chronology I tried to, to, to paint, uh, yes, I think there are new mechanisms and new, how do I say, uh, uh, ways of, of constructing. I cannot say planning because I don't see any planning. I see just uh, construction. Um, as I said, this law of legalization is something that is new and I find quite important. Um, there is this whole, uh, I think we have gone even further on with this, seeing the city, not just city, seeing the land as a prey. So uh, there are multiple reasons, of course, uh, first to construct, uh, especially public, uh, how do you say, like roads and uh, squares or so public spaces and public infrastructure, um, it always brings you a lot of money because you can take the, the to put it simple, you can take the tax money and uh, uh, put some more into it that is actually needed for the for those works and so on. So put and tender it tender it to friends. Exactly. So you have some the same companies doing the works all the time and so on. And also money laundering, which is uh, quite good handy with uh, new apartments, new buildings, and so on and so on. So there are, there are many reasons why the city, now I'm talking about Belgrade, is being uh, heavily uh, constructed these days. So we have, in the last couple of years, we have uh, works literally every, everywhere. And you have the same square being redone over and over again. And we, we have more and more square meters just arising everywhere. So that's, that's one of the, the things that we have this heavy construction happening and I'm not quite sure where will that go because 
we don't have the infrastructure for it, first of all. And the second of all, uh, I think it comes totally without a plan. So it has very uh, and, and various uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, really bad consequences. The other thing is, as I mentioned, so seeing the, the land, the city as a prey is uh, intensively taking uh, 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 public or resources, natural resources and public resources and privatizing them in terms of um, a few people benefit uh, financially from it. In Belgrade, we have now uh, what is in stake is this Makish field, the main um, water supply area, water supply system that is supposed to be uh, heavily constructed with more over 4 million square meters and for seven, seven, 72,000 people. And now it's a completely uh, 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 empty field that is used for uh, water supply system of Belgrade. So if we construct that, not only that we build a city within a city, that we destroy our water supply system, we also build a wall uh, that will ecologically, they say, experts say, be very, very bad for climate in Belgrade and so on and so on. So taking these natural resources and seeing them as a construction land is something that we see all over Serbia. And it's completely, uh, how do you say, um, unsustainable. Unsustainable. It's an ecological crisis that is about to happen any mm. day now. Because there is a whole ecological uh, aspect to, uh, this, to, to this um, conversation, right? Yes, exactly. And, I mean, what is happening in the south of Serbia is that the rivers are being put in these uh, dams, this mini, uh, how do you say? Uh, Hy hydro plants. Yeah, hydro, hydro plants. Now they're supposed to be a, a, a same coal, not a coal mine, but I don't know what kind of a, a mine in the uh, Mining, western yeah. Serbia. Yeah, so it's a it's heavily destroying, the, as yeah. I mentioned, heavily destroying resources because somebody can uh, make some profit on, on, on destroying it, basically. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I also saw that um, video of a uh, river, I think Ibar uh, mm. river, uh, just completely covered with plastic waste. Uh, I guess there's so much um, kind of illegal uh, waste sites. Um, yes. But that's rivers. also just to connect these two things. What what I think, what I see, and what I see through my research, is that this manner of what I mentioned before, just like taking resources, exploiting them with no plan, and uh, building heavily, constructing heavily all around Belgrade. Uh, what I see is that that is happening, as I mentioned, based on this backdoor deals with no actual planning. So the plans. The, the planning procedures are there just in order to legalize these deals that were already made. And I'm connecting that to this extra legal construction we mentioned at the beginning of the conversation and through this whole history, the chronology I presented, because I think um, it came from that manner. It came from that uh, attitude, from that way of seeing the city. Mm. So the law of legalization I mentioned, I, I think that that, that goes in the same corpus in a way. So this whole idea of abandoning planning and just making deals, being corruptive and then uh, legalizing all of it afterwards. So I think now that got on a, even a mm. bigger scale. That's the difference. What was actually your question? There was one there was one interesting example that you mention in your talks often and it marries the example marries both uh, illegality within the uh, built environment area and also political connections corruption uh, friendships as well as kind of media oppression and it's it's an example that is the perfect uh, uh, perfect example that illustrates so much of, of what's going on and that is the example of pink television headquarters i recently wrote uh, um article 
a book chapter for this uh, monument building, a friends from Slovenia published it. So I am uh, uh, recommending it here. It's in English, very interesting book, all, all sorts of interesting topic. And I presented briefly, but um, I presented this pink television case here. So you can maybe read more about it here and I hope I will write more about it in the future. But uh, yes, this pink, pink television, uh, first of all, this uh, pink television is how do you say the, the media empire uh, in, uh, in the region actually, not only in Serbia. Uh, it was founded, now I forgot, somewhere in the 90s, but it became, um, in the early 90s, but it became already super powerful uh, 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 in the Milosevic regime, but by having close connections to Milosevic family. So it literally came out of this uh, war propaganda and the motto was actually to show the uh, world through this uh, pink tainted glasses. So not to see the horrors of war, but to see something more pleasant to the eye and sound, uh, ear and so on. So this turbo folk music was uh, something that was presented first in this television that was close, closely connected to this television and radio and so on and so on. And it grew in time. But what is I find to be really interesting is that um, the, the new building of pink television was started to be built at the end of the 90s, 1998. The whole process behind it is again very interesting because uh, there was already this uh, uh, some building on the on the land on the spot, and um, the investor, the owner of this television, um, issued uh, how do you say requested this permanent permanent uh, license to build a temporary object, so not to build this whole new stable big television building but to build some temporary temporary thing of course he started to build this whole this, this big new television building but from 300 square meters how much he asked for in the beginning and then it was just a bit more a bit more a bit more so this license changed in time and at the end he built illegally now I forgot the number, but I think it's 3,000 or 4,000 square meters. So it's way, way, way more than, than in the beginning. But the whole process, as I said, is very interesting because um, the authorities uh, gave him all the green lights. So it was quite obvious that this building was not built as a temporary little object that grew, but when you see its architecture, you see it was constructed in such a manner from the start. So he had, the investor had the intention to use the system, to use this um, ability to build, to have a permanent uh, uh, license, how do you say, and to build more than it's allowed. And I see it as one of the first or important cases of manipulating the system in such a manner and the system being okay with it because obviously the authorities knew what was happening. I mean, when you look at the whole uh, uh, case and so on. And at the end in 2003, I believe the law, the city law was actually changed. So the guy who could uh, uh, legalize his building of course, I cannot say, when I say the civil law was changed, I, I cannot put the fing finger and say, this was done because of this. I'm not saying that, I'm, don't sue me. But I'm saying that when you look at the uh, events and at the time when they happened, the law was changed. A Couple of months later on, this building was finally legalized based on what that law provided after years of years of uh, trying to legalize it and to, and building it in a way it was built. So uh, what I found actually to be the most interesting is that, that this was happening in the times of democratic government, democratic change, and that the, this new democratic government actually embraced uh, this whole legacy of Milosevic time, of Milosevic era, 
of the 90s, this whole pink television, probably thinking that it could serve them now. And now this guy, this television is still around. It's super powerful and it's growing with this uh, current regime in a way. So yeah, it's, I use that building to show how this democratic change actually just continued with all the mechanisms and manners that were happening before. And there is a continuity. It, it didn't make a shift that it was supposed to happen in my opinion. I mean, what is, what is interesting is that this building, uh, apart from all the kind of in, interesting aspects in terms of how it's built and legally and extra legally, um, there is this whole element of uh, what this media organization does in, in modern, in, in contemporary Serbia, and uh, that it's a really a pillar for uh, authoritarian government. Um, yeah, but it's also interesting now that you mentioned, uh, uh, I thought that was, that was what you're going to say, so I remembered. Um, this building was legalized somewhere, I'm not sure because I, I cannot see the permit, the, 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 the city, the um, institutions wouldn't uh, let me, but let's say it was legalized after 2003. But so before that, it was still illegal. Uh, in 2001, I think it uh, got, it was awarded by several architectural prizes. So uh, our architectural profession saw this building as something worth awarding. In the times, well, it was illegal. And a professor of mine, Senia Petovar, actually made a comment about it. Like, how can you give a award to a building that is illegal? And the, the, the jury, jury of uh, one of this exhibition said, yeah, we're not dealing with the legal, legal status of the building, we're dealing with its architecture. And I think that tells a lot. Yeah, and I think that kind of connects to the, to the, to the kind of one of the earlier questions I asked about architectural profession um, in, in, in the country. There's also activism in your work. I can say that as an activist, you know, classical, uh, 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 understanding of that term, whatever that means. I was most active within the citizen initiative, uh, Do Not Let Belgrade Drown, Nedalimo Belgrade. And we uh, uh, gathered uh, uh, in 2014 when, where, when this Belgrade Waterfront project uh, was presented. So a group of experts in all sorts of fields, uh, we try to, first we try to get information on what is actually happening uh, uh, with this project, what is actually gonna be built, because it's an enormous project on the waterfront, it was shady from the start and so on. We can talk about it later on if you wish. And then we started to, then we started to oppose it when we understand what was going on. And we started to, we wanted to inform the public. A lot has happened there. Uh, at some point there was this, um, the group group of masked people destroyed this one street in the area in the middle of the night in 2016, and it was the middle of the election night, and the police uh, was called, but um, they didn't come, the police refused to come to the spot, and so on, and I think that was the event that triggered the public the most. So uh, we, we organized protests before, but after that event, event, the protests started to be really massive. So we had, I don't know, 10,000, some say 30,000 people on the streets uh, protesting uh, this project and everything that presented actually, such as this uh, uh, demolition in the middle of the night and people uh, refusing to come to the spot and to serve, uh, police refusing to come to the spot and to serve the people. Um, in 2018, we went to, we ran for Belgrade elections. The election process was a topic for itself. Uh, yeah. It's something that it's also worth discussing, but okay. So uh, it went good, but we didn't reach the goal, uh, but we, we were actually quite satisfied with what we managed to do in uh, under the circumstances with an amount with no basically resources whatsoever. 
yeah. and so on. So and without access to the media. Yes, no access to the media, which is very important in the uh, election mm -hmm. process. Um, afterwards, the initiative uh, continued to be to for, to let's say organize in a form of a political party mode. More now, it's also preparing for the next COVID elections and so on. I, uh, because of my personal uh, um, reasons in terms of not being able to clone myself <laughs> and not having enough time and energy for everything I would like to do and everything I think it's needed to be done. I focused more on uh, urban planning topics and on what my profession is. And um, let's say that the main focus now would be that in 2019, we started this project in Sezakude toward collaborative uh, governance, interactive urbanism. There, uh, so the project is run by uh, me, by Sezakude in cooperation, cooperation with uh, uh, colleagues uh, such as Ksenia Radovanovic and professors from uh, architectural faculty, this integral urbanism course I mentioned, Maria Mara, Daniela Milovanovic Rodic. And we also work with uh, alumni of this uh, master course. So this is a long-term project. Uh, it consists of three segments. And I think that answers your question. That, that is why I'm talking about it more in detail. Mm -hmm. uh, one is research. So we did extensive researches on some case studies, uh, complex projects uh, through different phases. I don't know how much can you see. The second mm -hmm. is public talks. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to create this uh, public arena uh, where we would meet people who do not usually meet. That is also one of the goals of Tzadzaka So people from institutions, citizens, uh, we also try the private sector and so on. So trying to over, uh, how do you say, to uh, go uh, to deal with conflicts by through public, uh, through, through discussion, through mutual, through having democratic ways of dealing with conflicts, basically. Mm -hmm. And the third uh, aspect is this uh, website, interactive uh, urbanism, which would be actually informing, um, informing people, informing general public. So what I'm trying to say is, to answer your question, I also find it to be activism. Uh, what I'm trying to do now most of the time is to, uh, um, empower uh, citizens, experts, all sorts of group by spreading knowledge, by providing access to uh, information, to how do you say, truthful information and uh, providing ways of uh, being able to express yourself, to discuss, to be heard and so on. So yes. I think, I think that's also an important part of, of uh, uh, activism, empowering people, empowering experts to be able to uh, get information, to get knowledge, to understand the processes of urban planning in order to be able to participate in them. Um, I just want to understand whether the processes exist in the kind, in the, legal framework in Serbia and it's just the case that they're not being followed uh, because of the corruption or they don't exist culturally they just don't exist and you kind of have to almost uh, start from scratch building building a whole system of public involvement within the planning process well, the process uh, the how do you say the system uh, uh, is enabling public participation in uh, different um, uh, how do you say different different parts of the planning process let's put it that way but it's just pro form it's not actually uh, it's not real public participation exactly. first of all because of what I mentioned before and that is something that we see through this uh, chronology is that this uh, for example, here we try to, to show how one planning uh, process for one, one area looked like. And we have different colors here, which you see. So these are different um, 
So laws, uh, plans, uh, I don't know, protests, uh, and so on, so, so on. What I'm trying to say, what we see is that the, as I mentioned before, the this decisions are made way before this uh, planning procedure in which public can participate. So even though this public participation is just performed, so you go to the public hearing, you write your comments, they read it, they say, no, we, we don't take this. Even if the, your comments there would be, uh, 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 how do you say, accepted, the, the, we see through this, the decisions were made a long time ago. So this whole mm -hmm. procedure exists, but pro form. It's not, it doesn't actually give, it's not designed to give any power to different parties to participate, mm -hmm. to, to make any, to contribute to decisions. But so how do, you, how do you generate change? That's what I wanted to say now. In order to change it, I think it's a very, very long process. It's very complicated. But what I think, and my colleagues as well, is that first of all, uh, we have to make these pro procedures and processes transparent. We have to understand them. So if we think that these procedures are not good, we have to understand them to mark the, the weak points in order to make them different. Right now, when you talk about uh, 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 urban planning uh, or spatial planning in Serbia, I think that most of the people just see this big, uh, oof, what, what is happening here? I don't understand anything, especially with this media situation that you mentioned, we have media censored. So first of all, people cannot get information. Without information, they cannot understand what is happening. Without, without understanding what is happening, without understanding the procedures, they cannot take part. And to put it simple, basically that's the first step. We try to make this procedure transparent, to make them understandable to general public, to uh, um, uh, spread, uh, to, uh, how do you say, to give knowledge, to make knowledge accessible. In well, to inform to the public, inform just the inform public. them in the first place. Yeah. Yes, but also like to give to like make knowledge accessible because at the end everybody had to make their own decisions, and in order to to be able to do that, they have to understand the process and to have some basic knowledge on the consequences, possible consequences, and so on. But also, we're uh, working with all sorts of experts. We're trying to empower the experts as well. Uh, because we think that uh, although we have weak institutions, and that's one of the basic problems in Serbia, that the institutions are weak and the state is captured. Uh, in many of these institutions, we have really good experts who sit there and who would like to do something, but they need to be empowered. They have to have the support to know that they're not al alone uh, and so on and so on. So. I think there are all kinds of ways that you can work, but it's at the end, those maybe they look like small steps, but I think they are needed for the long run. And this has to be a long run because I don't think we can make a shift in over overnight. We have to change the whole system and to build a new system basically, which is super complicated so and super long. <laughs> So do you ever get to communicate with the government or officials? We get to communicate with people from uh, different uh, mini ministries, ministries. Yeah, ministries, ministries yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... So how, how is that dialogue? It, it's good because also in those uh, institutional or government bodies, how do you call them? You have people who are experts and who actually want to do something good. So. Uh, how to reach those who make the decisions, the final decisions, that's mm. a tricky one. But, yeah. Decision-making process in Serbia is so centralized. It's almost like a one person, a bit like a Saudi kingdom or something. Uh, so it's kind of hard to, um, I guess, even the people within the, go within the governing bodies and ministries have to be empowered themselves in order to, to be exactly. able to make any meaningful change. Um, and to call the things uh, by their name, 
I don't know if somebody's going to kill me after this, but uh, at the end, it all comes down to corruption, especially when it comes to urban planning and to construction. Uh, there's a big money at stake. So that is why it's really hard to, uh, um, to make influence on some of the big decisions such, such as building uh, on Mackish Field and Belgrade Waterfront and so on and so on. But I think we have to, to try our best. Um, I think it'd be nice to just reflect on, I think part of what you were talk about uh, is also uh, this, the kind of socialist heritage, the new Belgrade, and that is one of the things that you are an expert in. And I just want to ask, does that offer some answers? Do, do ways in which buildings were procured or built or even designed uh, pre-1990 uh, can offer some answers as to how, uh, how the system could uh, potentially work or be more inclusive or how can architecture kind of be more in service of um, wider society? Now I would say when you ask me about it uh, that maybe one of the greatest differences I see and something that we could in this political economical system look up to uh, uh, how do you say, like take from this socialist uh, period mm -hmm. is that this, um, the architecture and urban planning and construction in those times, um, they had, they did extensive research on architectural projects, on urban planning, on general plans for the city and so, so uh, you had experts to put it simple, you had experts who were researching human needs, um, from human needs to, I don't know, uh, infrastructure ways, uh, materials, and so on and so on. So these were not just, as you would put it, uh, like, um, let's say, economical projects, like uh, not just how to make more money, how to build a few square meters more and make more, more money to, to profit, but you had all sorts of, as I mentioned, um, studies and researchers research and uh, you see you could see it through the built environment i didn't think we have that today and i think that is something that we actually need so more well basically more theory i mean actually we need more theory more studies more research in order to think our architectures and our city our architecture and our cities better and I think that is, that is something we really need to empower our profession in order to go to that direction. There was something when, when we met, um, I was telling you how the planning works in the UK. And I was telling you how th there are many things you can negotiate uh, and things that sometimes even feel like um, half illegal are kind of legalized. Um, so there is, um, I, I don't know if you remember, but I was telling you about this this mechanism within the planning system called section 106 where the uh, where the local authority can give planning for something that's not quite uh, a lot within the planning guidance yeah but actually it's good that you mentioned that because maybe we should add that uh, i don't think that this how would you say um planiranja this uh, abandoning planning that's something uh, specific to Serbia or the region. I think that's something that is happening more or less everywhere. I mean, in a way, it's also a capitalist way of, uh, uh, of thinking, of producing. So mm -hmm. uh, short-term, uh, uh, how do you say, benefit capital and so on. So uh, yeah, I think we have that in some form more or less everywhere, but again, when you look specifically to, uh, uh, to Belgrade, uh, this region, you see some specific forms. I guess now you mentioned you have some specific forms in England, in the UK, which, is, which are also quite interesting. And here we also have some, our specific forms. And I think because our society is in a way always in some form of crisis in the last, I don't know how many years, and uh, when you live in this constant crisis, in a way, 
things tend to get a bit more extreme. So maybe mm -hmm. this abandoning planning is a bit more extreme in some forms, as you can see in my Instagram account. Mm -hmm. Because in the West, in the architectural schools here, there is always this, um, there is almost a bit of a romantic approach to seeing people uh, enclosing their uh, balconies and having personal expressions, painting. In Serbia, you can, you can often find in a, in a kind of skyscraper, somebody would have painted their little section of their flat. They would paint the facade yeah. in a different color, like on a 13th floor. No, no, I think it's quite important that you mentioned that, uh, and thank you, because I think we should, we should say that people often uh, romanticize, as you said, this um, uh, building on your own, but um, I don't share that, uh, that view. I don't share that view here in Serbia, because what I see is that, uh, and Dobroka Sajkovic actually wrote about it in her book, book Glossy. I will speak to her, by the way. Okay, Glossy Zoromantish. She he actually gave a really good example of it. Um, how the, if you can say, the ordinary people or the small people, people who are not influential, who don't have the means, money, power, and to this corruptive uh, uh, ways, um, they get the, they get punished. So they're the who ones suffer, who, yeah. who suffer from this uh, extra legal system, basically. Because uh, okay, we uh, obviously we don't have good social uh, housing policies. Um, we don't. Uh, there's something the system is doing wrong when it comes to people meeting their housing needs and so on, and people are forced to uh, build extra legally. Uh, but even that, most of them cannot do that. Now it's, it's the situation is that mostly those who have means and are close to those in power can uh, uh, build two stories uh, uh, extra. So I wouldn't be able to build two stories extra on my on my on my building. So it is a corruptive mechanism, first of all, and second of all. What I have seen with this law of legalization is that it is quite often that you want to build, build legally, you want to do things right, but the system is forcing you in a way to do it extra legally and it, it becomes cheaper and faster to do it that way. So the system is putting you in this corruptive field mm. and I don't think that benefits ordinary people. So I, I hate that expression, ordinary people, but like people who are not in this corruptive uh, 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 sphere, how to call it. So I'm not for aromatizing yeah, yeah. yeah. this uh, phenomena. I think it, that is something that uh, hurts most of the uh, uh, general public or people who- I mean, I, I, I guess I'm saying this because when we came to Belgrade, I came with a group of students from the Architectural Association and we, uh, I mean, I myself see some, I sometimes even see something quite cute about uh, this. Yeah, I think it's um, quite often, it's quite often that people are wrong. That's why I said it's, it's important that you mention it because it's actually, if you don't know the context, if you don't understand the yeah. uh, the whole story behind it, if you don't know the processes, you can say it's it's uh, it's very interesting. It can be quite cute, mm -hmm. and it's also like okay, people do not have means to I don't know buy an apartment, but they have the ability to build some extra square meters and to live better. And you know why not? But then when you understand the story behind it, it's 